Here's a startling fact. 40% of Palestinian men in the West Bank and Jerusalem have spent time in Israeli prisons. And what every elected US official touts as the only democracy in the Middle East, somehow its justice system criminalizes a vast swath of the population. But what types of crimes are being committed that warrants such an incarceration rate? To find out more, I visited the offices of Adamir in Ramallah, the most prominent prisoners' rights organization in Palestine, and talked to Laith Abu Ziyad, an international advocacy officer for Adamir. So how many Palestinians have been through the prison system and why is the number so high? So since the beginning of the Israeli occupation in 1967, um, around 800,000 Palestinians have been arrested, which um, constitutes um, almost 20% of the entire Palestinian population and 40% of the male population. Um, and I would say the number is high because, uh, not just because Palestinians um, are resisting the Israeli occupation, but also the existence of arbitrary laws that um, criminalize any kind of political activities, um, whether um, like within like military orders that have been issued since the beginning of the occupation as well, and also the issuance of like, the Israeli Knesset issuance of new laws that always criminalize any kind of resistance, um, whether it's violent or non-violent um, tools of resistance. Talk about what forms of non-violent resistance are being penalized. Um, for example, even like um, BDS or taking um, like any activity that supports um, like boycotting um, Israel, um, and also even sometimes writing things on Facebook, which has been a recent precedent as well. Um, which is considered as an incitement um, accusation by the Israeli uh, authorities. Um, so even like even writing something on Facebook or um, taking part in a demonstration that's not violent um, can be considered um, a criminal um, activity as well. So people in America might be shocked to learn that you can't write things on Facebook and that you could get arrested. I mean, how common is this? How many people have been arrested for that? Um, according to our um, documentation unit, um, almost since the beginning of um, the current uprising, since October 2015, uh, more than 300 Palestinians have been arrested for posting things on social media. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it depends, um, like the, the, the sentencing depends on the likes and shares they get, which is ridiculous. So if you write something on Facebook and you only had one share and one like, then your sentence might be lower than a person that had a hundred likes and probably like 50 shares on his um, Facebook post. Um, so these are the criteria that the, whether the military court um, um, in the West Bank or sometimes even Israeli civil courts rely on uh, when they sentence um, somebody based on what they call incitement. Most commonly, people are arrested for sharing or liking images of their friends and loved ones who are killed by Israeli forces. In one case, the person accused of incitement had only shared a photo of his own brother that had been killed by the Israeli army. Or it's something even more innocuous, like what happened to Jern Kada, a 19-year-old university student who was kidnapped by Israeli soldiers in the middle of the night and interrogated about a poem she posted on Facebook. A quote from the poem she posted was, If I leave suddenly, keep me in your prayers. According to Kara, officials kept asking, Why did you post it? Do you want to die? She was placed in administrative detention for three months without charges or trial. What about protesting here um, and belonging to political parties in the West Bank? So for the West Bank, there's the military, uh, the military, uh, military law system, um, which, um, which constitutes around 2,400 military orders um, and according to military order 101 taking part in any political activity is considered an illegal activity so even like raising a flag or handing a leaflet or, the, or even yeah taking part in a demonstration is considered an illegal activity there is no right to protest on the west bank all political parties are considered illegal this is because palestinians in the west bank are actually under israeli military law all of their political and legal rights are dictated by an occupying army. The occupation has been in place since the Israeli invasion in 1967. And since this offensive to conquer all of Palestine, the Israeli military regime has used extreme violence, as well as their dictatorial legal system to punish any Palestinians who stand up for their rights. Palestinians in the West Bank lived for 20 years under military rule before the first major rebellion. Life under occupation was defined by regular violence and poverty. 
tensions mounted especially in the 80s as illegal colonial settlements expanded. The settler population in the West Bank went from 35,000 in 1984 to 64,000 just four years later. Things came to a head in 1987. After several killings by soldiers and settlers, people everywhere broke out in a mass protest in what became known as the First Intifada. From Gaza to Jerusalem to the West Bank and even surrounding refugee camps in neighboring countries took part in mass, united actions. They were the largest demonstrations in Palestinian history, including a general strike, which lasted for four straight years. Israel responded with unspeakable repression. It deployed around 80,000 combat soldiers to crush the uprising of more than half a million Palestinians across the territories. By 1989, 12,000 Palestinians had been rounded up into Israeli jails. In just the first two years, the targeting of minors was so high that nearly 30,000 children required medical treatment from beatings and bullets. The violence against children was officiated by one of the most cruel state policies ever employed. Israeli army chief Yitzhak Rabin, who later became the prime minister, announced an iron fist policy of breaking the bones of Palestinians at protests. This was implemented by the army on a massive scale. Countless videos of soldiers intentionally breaking the arms and legs of Palestinian youth shined a spotlight on the true face of occupation. But Palestinians stood strong against these brutal tactics, forcing the Oslo peace process in 1991. But it was bogus. While claiming it was to bring about a sovereign Palestinian state, Israel continued to conquer more of the land. Between 1993 and 2001, the number of Israeli settlers in the West Bank increased from 150,000 to 370,000. The so-called peace process collapsed. In 2000, another mass protest was crushed. Seven Palestinians were killed and over 300 wounded. So began the second intifada. The movement, met with incessant state violence when totally peaceful, developed into an armed struggle. The most vicious attack came in April 2002, where the Israeli military demolished the Janine refugee camp in the West Bank, killing 52 Palestinians, many left beneath the rubble for weeks. The Israeli government deployed a sweeping policy of targeted assassinations and jailing of political leaders. They also began construction of the apartheid wall, which scars the entire landscape today. It was declared illegal by the International Court of Justice in 2004. Since then, the military regime has continued to pile on more and more military orders, which they call laws, to punish Palestinians for any and all acts of resistance. One of the most symbolic acts of resistance is throwing stones at armored tanks and soldiers, a living picture of the David and Goliath legend. But such inconvenient symbolism is unacceptable for the Israeli occupation. Thousands of Palestinians are arrested every month, the majority of them for throwing rocks. The majority of those arrested for this offense are children. For many years, youth were generally held for several months to up to two years for throwing stones. But over the past few years, Israel has increased the penalty to draconian heights. Now, Palestinians face a minimum of three years, 10 years for simply throwing a stone at a vehicle, and up to 20 years if they're charged with intent to harm with the stone. When the stricter punishment passed, Israeli Justice Minister Ayelet Shaked boasted, Tolerance towards terrorists ends today. A stone thrower is a terrorist, and only a fitting punishment can serve as a deterrent and just punishment. Then in 2015, an amendment was added that collectively punished the families of those prosecuted in Jerusalem. It gave the Israeli government the authority to cancel state health insurance and other social benefits for the parents of imprisoned minors. While many stone throwers go to prison, Others suffer more serious repercussions. I met with a young Palestinian named Aya at her home in Ramallah. She paid a major price for throwing a stone at a mass protest against the 2012 war in Gaza at the infamous Kalandia checkpoint. I was participating every day in demonstrations to express my feelings because the Gaza war left an impact on me. Especially after I saw images of dead children, one was dead in his mom's belly, and the graphic scenes on TV, and it was scary, and I couldn't stay at home. So I started to protest with them every day. On that day, I was on the front line with the protesters because I was excited. But then we started to clash with the soldiers, and they prevented us from entering. They started to shoot tear gas, and most were running back afraid of choking from the gas. But other protesters kept going despite the gas and everything. But after protesters threw stones and the soldiers shot the tear gas, we were surprised that they shot live bullets. 
Just suddenly, without any warning or telling us to go back, they started to shoot live bullets with M16s. We didn't know because sounds of shooting were ongoing. There was a guy who was the first one of us to get shot, right in the heart, and he was killed. We were scared and I thought I should go back after one was killed. But then I said I'm going for the sake of the people in Gaza. I continued protesting. It began at 9.30 p.m. till 11.30 p.m. I had a slingshot and I was trying to use it to throw a stone. So I took it and I was standing on my knees to throw the stone at them when they shot me here. They shot me with a live round and I couldn't do anything. I thought I died. At the same time, I saw all my friends running while the soldiers were shooting everyone. I was shocked that my friend who wasn't doing anything except holding up a Palestinian flag was shot with a bullet that went through both her legs. And now she's paralyzed, she's lost her legs. After all of that, the number of injuries was almost 360. 200 of them were shot by a live bullet, and the rest were injured by gas, rubber bullets, and one was killed. My family took me in the same moment they arrived, while bullets were still inside my leg and the wound wasn't stitched yet, because there was a priority for doctors to save other serious injuries. So my family, without the knowledge of the doctors, took me out of the hospital without letting anyone know. Because they don't want my name to be entered in the computer at the hospital, because then my name would be registered, and that means it will go to the Israelis. And they will put a mark on me as if I'm charged of something and can arrest me. Seriously, if that happened again, I wouldn't feel scared to go down to protest on the checkpoint, even if I was shot. Aya is one of hundreds of Palestinians shot in the pelvic region. And not by mistake, Israel has shifted in recent years to a policy known as shoot to cripple. Doctors and activists have marked a sudden increase in bullet wounds to the pelvic region, targeting knees and genitalia. In 2015, during the latest anti-occupation uprising, Netanyahu pushed through measures giving security forces even more leeway to use live ammunition against protesters. At the same time, they increased arrests and subjected thousands more people to a legal system that by no stretch can be considered just. So the conviction rate according to statistics released by the IPS, which is the Israeli Prison Service, now within these military courts, um, the conviction rate is 99.7%, um, which shows how um, unfair the system is. Seems like a kangaroo court. Yeah. Um, you're talking about administrative detention. What is that and, and why is it used? So administrative detention is the process that allows um, like Israeli authorities um, to place somebody in detention without um, so without telling without telling him the reason that he's being detained and also um, so his detention is based on secret information and it can be renewed every six months indefinitely um, so it's holding somebody in prison without charge or trial basically ironically administrative detention is a leftover law from British colonial rule the Israeli occupying forces simply adopted it when they came the new colonizers in 2015, the use of administrative detention increased 50%. Of the 7,500 Palestinians in Israeli jails, 750 are being held without charge or trial. If sent to administrative detention, a Palestinian may experience up to 180 days of interrogation, the first 60 of which may occur without a lawyer. Even the attorney doesn't have an access to the secret information, so he cannot even defend um, the prisoner or the detainee because he doesn't know what he's being detained for. Um, and yeah, of course, it's, a, it's an arbitrary detention that for our organization amounts to psychological torture because the detainee lives in a permanent state of waiting where he doesn't know when will he be released from prison. And it's also used against various sectors of the Palestinian society, whether women, children, even legislative council members. Um, and of course, it's a punitive measure, um, as I said, to control the, the political sphere and even to punish those um, accused of being involved in any illegal activity. Mm. Hundreds have turned to the only thing they have left, their own bodies, willing to die to get their message heard. In 2012, over 2,000 prisoners participated in a mass hunger strike, more than one-third of the prison population at the time. When the hunger strike became effective at drawing international attention, Israel took that away too. In 2015, the government passed a law allowing the force feeding of hunger strikers, designated by the UN as a form of cruel and unusual punishment, tantamount to torture. 
Gilad Erdan, Israel's public security minister, said of the law, Security prisoners are interested in turning a hunger strike into a new type of suicide terrorist attack, which they will threaten the state of Israel. We will not allow anyone to threaten us, and we will not allow prisoners to die in our prisons. The story of a recent hunger striker, Bilal Qaid, illustrates how cruel administrative detention really is. So the case of Bilal Qaid was sentenced um, to 14 years and a half in prison, and then on the day of his scheduled release, on the 13th of June 2016, he was given a six months administrative detention order. So he, on the same day, he, um, he embarked on hunger strike um, as a result of that arbitrary decision taken by the military commander, of course. It's so cool because you bring someone to the edge of knowing that they're going to get released and then you just pile on another sentence. I mean, I just can't think of anything more cruel than that. Other than this, maybe. <laughs> the fact that there are hundreds of children. There are hundreds of children in Israeli jails. The number is growing exponentially. According to one report, 97% of cases, no lawyer was present. Mm -hmm. um, nearly 90% weren't even informed of why they were being arrested. I mean, what is happening here? Mm -hmm. The attack against um, children is in something recent as well, but um, there has been um, an increase in the number of child detainees um, since also the uprising in October 2015. According to our documentation as well, in 2015, the Israeli government arrested more than 900 children. So only in, in one year, um, 900, 900 children were arrested by the Israeli government. Um, yeah, and most of these children were sub sub subjected to like some kind or some forms of torture, cruel and inhumane, degrading treatment. Um, and also, like most of these children didn't have um, their parents present during interrogation. The, the, the torture techniques used against children are more of like psychological ones. I mean, they are subjected to some physical um, torture, such as beatings and kickings, but the, the psychological ones are more common. And also, the use of threats against family members is, is a common torture technique um, used against children as well. So the interrogator would um, tell the child, oh, if you don't confess your crime, then I'm going to arrest your mom, I'm going to arrest your dad. Um, so it's a form of like, coercion to, to force them to confess their crimes. Um, and in some cases, like children were deceived. Um, to give a confession to an attorney that by the end um, when he wasn't an attorney, he was actually an interrogator. So sometimes they take a person would go into the interrogation room and tell the child, okay, I'm your attorney, just tell me what you did. And then it turns out that that person works for either like the military court or um, yeah, so basically for the, the Israeli government. Sometimes the child is forced to sign something that he wouldn't understand in Hebrew. Um, and yeah, and nobody would even translate, um, take the paper that he's forced to sign, that it can be um, like a confession that can be used against him in the military court. I mean, this just seems really crazy. How does this kind of rate compare to other countries? Like usually in other countries, children can only be arrested if they're 18 and above. But in, in Israel, they arrest um, children as young as 12 and sometimes even younger, but they would detain them for a few hours. Um, but some children were sentenced for six months in prison, four months. I mean, after their release from prison, even their families start noticing like, some changes in their behavior. Some of them drop out of school as a result of torture or trauma. And also, the, like most of them are traumatized because even like the arrest, like um, yeah, the, the arrest process, they arrest them like most children are arrested during um, military. Uh, night raids um, on their houses, which can leave them traumatized as well. And also all, all these interrogation and like torture that they go through. And even the prison experience in itself can be difficult for children. And and yeah, so after their release, um, it's, yeah, it's like it has so many negative um, effects on them. Like, of course, um, we documented many cases of children being subjected to sexual harassment or even a threat of being raped by the interrogation by the interrogators as well. Child or adult, they are jailed. Compounding this repression, the Palestinian Prisoner Society estimates that 90% of Palestinian prisoners have been subjected to torture by Israeli forces. Even more egregiously, a 2013 report by the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel revealed that Palestinian prisoners, including children, were kept in outdoor iron cages during severe winter weather. 
This torture is in many forms, from solitary confinement to physical pain to sexual assault. In some cases, um, since also October 2015, um, even some prisoners who were injured before being arrested were subjected to sexual harassment inside hospitals. Um, so sometimes even by um, like medical staff. Um, um, so in one of the cases that we documented, um, the person was shot before he was detained and then he was taken to a hospital and then um, like some of the prison, like the hospital guards and even like the nurses, they were taking nude pictures of him. So one of the prison guards came close to the, to the prisoner and then um, he took off his pants, um, like the, the guard, and then he asked him to suck his basically. Um, and, and, and that was like a sexual harassment against a man. And they, they, they use it against men as well to sort of like destroy this heroic image. Like how the society perceives these prisoners as heroes, they want to destroy the, this image by saying, I can easily sexually harass you. And, you know, there's still people in prison from the Second Intifada and that are going to be in there for, for decades more. I mean, talk about what that does to actually any resistance efforts in the country. Yeah, of course, it, um, it destroys the spirit of resistance within the society. And also, I would say that like, probably most Palestinians are more concerned now to go in prison because they know once they go in, then they'll probably stay there, like maybe for the rest of their life. From making peaceful protest illegal to force-feeding hunger strikers, Israel has taken away literally every means Palestinians have to resist the human rights violations they suffer on a daily basis by this occupation. And jail is used as the ultimate tool of silence to shutter their advocacy for freedom. As resistance inside occupied Palestine becomes increasingly strangled, resistance on the outside grows more essential.